right now we're really thrilled to have on one of the premier fighters or the premier fighter for liberty in the United States. It's former congressman, uh, Republican congressman and presidential candidate and host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. It's Dr. Ron Paul. It's so glad to have you. Thanks for coming here. Thank you, Jimmy. Nice to be with you today. So I real quickly, um, you were always a voice for non-interventionism. And I, re I remember watching when you ran for president that the debates that you would tell the truth and the people would like it. But uh, the media and the other politicians would pretend like you didn't exist. Do you remember that? Well, yeah, very much so. But occasionally, depending on the audience, sometimes uh, the position uh, when I talked about non-interventionism and not uh, doing any harm to uh, anybody uh, there were some boos too. Right. Those were they tended to be the religious audience, but it is. It, I would never get any favorable uh, comments. Uh, it was usually more exclusion. You know, I didn't even qualify for being vicious, being vicious against me. They just uh, sort of excluded me. See, we did recently in some of these campaigns going on, and they said, "Well, you know." I so and so had six thousand people at this rally in California. Of course, it trumps out of that contest, but. I had like 8,000 at Berkeley, and we never even got a comment <laughs> made. So it's, it's ironic, uh, not ironic, but you have to understand how the reporting goes, and I'm sure you understand it as well as anybody. So I understand it because you actually challenge the establishment, and if you challenge the establishment, they, they ignore you. They pretend like you don't exist, right? Yeah, because if they if they pay attention to me, uh, I might get more credibility. But if they can ignore you, you know, maybe he'll go away. And uh, I may go different places and things, but the issue is not going to go away. There'll be people like you that'll keep these ideas alive for a long time. And and I'm I'm a strong believer in the ideas that make a difference rather than the political actions and the parties and all. All this stuff goes on on the media. Uh, but I think ideologically, uh, that is the way things are controlled, you know, whether it's economic theory, non-interventionism and what we are taught in the universities. What is the uh, consensus of the population, what the role of government ought to be and and really whether there is uh, some morality in the system, whether uh, they question the fact on whether we should be doing this. Sometimes they say, I can do it. It's constitutional, but maybe it's the wrong, wrong thing to do. So I think those kind of things control things rather than, you know, campaign here or there. I actually was pretty surprised that I got any attention at all, but and I ended up getting more than I expected. So uh, I, I wasn't, you know, really unhappy with it because I think I understood the system pretty well. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm also surprised at the reaction this show gets. But what this show tells me, it, it, what the reaction to this show tells me is that people are desperate for the truth from the media and from their politicians and they're not getting it. And that's why people like you are, are very popular and why you can get 9,000 people to come out to hear you talk in Berkeley, uh, because there's no one else is saying those things. And we live in, in, in a country where we really have one party. It's the money party, which is also a war party. And it's the party of wall street, uh, big pharma and the insurance companies and uh, fossil fuels. So, what you would be considered a libertarian. I'm a self-described progressive, yet we agree on the big things, uh -huh. meaning free speech and uh, uh, non-interventionism, ending our foreign wars and regime change wars. And uh, we agree on liberty. And we agree that as someone like Edward Snowden is an actually a hero. Right. Would, right. You, would you say Edward Snowden? Now, what, what does it say about our country where someone who exposes crimes is considered a criminal, but the people who continue to commit these crimes are now at the heads of our CIA and in government. What does that say? Well, I think the morality is turned up, upside down. And I think your point early that you made was about uh, telling the truth, because uh, I always assumed that uh, I wouldn't win the first election. I always assumed I wouldn't last long because I would still keep doing what I believe. And in the Bible Belt, 
in the district I had uh, back in the 70s, you know, not many people were talking about legalizing drugs. And I, as a physician, though, I think I had a little bit more credibility with it. And I said the drug drug laws aren't working and I'd get rid of them. And I always thought, well, that didn't me in. You know, uh, I, I, nobody will pay any attention. But actually, I think you touched on what it was. It was it was uh, being able to trust the person what they're saying. And I've had it take, brought brought to me so often that a constituent would come up and say, well, you know, I really don't quite agree with you on this. I think we should do this, but I know you're, you're doing your best and you're telling the truth and, and that's what we respect. And, and I don't think the politicians I knew in Washington, except for the few, realized how good, uh, how much of a value that was politically. And I mean, that was the whole thing for me. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact that I convinced my district that we better look into this Federal Reserve because there's a lot of collusion going on in the Federal Reserve. They didn't quite get there, but there are more people now that are are thinking about those those kind of things. But that wasn't the reason I got to Congress. I think it was uh, just the fact that uh, I would try to give them the straight scoop. And and I think though that when they hear about liberty and why it is something that is inclusive and people should be able to be brought together, young people especially were very receptive to this. And I keep thinking that uh, people who call themselves progressive, they call themselves libertarian and conservatives, it, it shouldn't be divisive at all, and you shouldn't compromise. Uh, Dennis Kucinich and I get along real well, but we know exactly what we don't get involved in and saying, well, I'm going to straighten you out. But I think it's bringing the coalitions together. So if you and I can talk and move along in this, and besides, uh, just, just think, Jimmy, if we're able to get them to agree, more people to agree with us, we're talking about the big issues. And I uh, Keep, uh, and many of the progressives uh, finally came around to looking at the uh, at the deception going on in our monetary system because none of this, if you don't like the wars or the runaway spending, none of it can happen, you know, without the Federal Reserve system. Yes, and you've been uh, calling out for the for the audit of the Fed, and how's that going? Well, it's still alive and well. I, and once again, I was impressed uh, on how far we got. Uh, we had two votes in the House, and we were able to win it overwhelmingly uh, for political reasons, not because they were doing me a favor. Uh, the Republicans voted with me because we made it a, a grassroots issue by going directly to the grassroots. But we had a lot of Democrats vote for it, too, because, uh, you know, transparency is a pretty good uh, thing to be in favor of. And people would both say, yeah, well, why, do, why don't we have transparency? And we can use that same, same way with a, an honest conservative who may be wanting to start too many wars. But you ought to have transparency. We ought to know where the money is. And we ought to find out who's, who's making the money when they're getting $600 for a little old hammer and stuff like that. So there should be an appeal uh, to a, 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 a broad base. And I, I just think that, you know, my explanation has always been that if you can get people together and say, yeah, I like my liberty. Well, I, I know you a bit, Jimmy, but I don't know all about you. I don't know what your personal life is all about or your, your spiritual life is all about, but it's irrelevant because you or somebody else can go their way and I can go my way as long as we follow the one rule that makes us libertarians is we cannot use force to impose our will on others. We can defend ourselves, but we can't say, hey, look. Uh, so and so, you don't understand this. And if you would straighten up your act, uh, the world would be a lot better off. That uh, that's uh, looking for trouble. And I'm afraid our foreign policy follows that rule, unfortunately. So you talked about transparency in government. That's the beauty of our government. It's, it's supposed to be transparent, so you don't have to trust politicians. <laughs> You're supposed to be able to check up on politicians, right? But we don't live in a transparent society. We actually we live in a surveillance state. Right. And so everything's done in secret. We have secret courts, FISA courts. We have secret investigations of the president. We have uh, uh, and other politicians. It seems like we've again, there's no morality in our government or the way we're we've gotten so far away from the Constitution, as you like to say, that we do live in a surveillance state. The criminals are are uh, lauded on television shows and at the top of our government, and the people who expose crimes are now being prosecuted. Like, well, Julian Assange, can you tell people what your position is on Julian Assange? <laughs> just uh, uh, just get away from it. We shouldn't be involved. He's not our citizen. 
Nixon. He didn't commit a crime against us. He's a journalist. And don't threaten him with anything. And we're the ones that organize uh, all, all the uh, aggression against him. But, you know, uh, what, uh, what we should do on this privacy thing, I think people got, we, our country got it twisted. You know, the, the government was supposed to be there, and the Fourth Amendment was to protect your privacy and my privacy. And, uh, and they were supposed to be transparent. But now all the privacy is with the government. And, you know, if you get a Assange or, uh, or anybody else who's a whistleblower, they're the enemy of the state. There's nothing more threatening to, uh, to government than their exposure. So we have it wrong. We don't have any privacy anymore, and the government has all the secrecy. It should be the other way around. And under those circumstances, believe me, there would be a difference in the expenditures in Washington because right now the secrets are kept uh, probably even in, in monetary financial affairs is to maintain a globalist empire that uh, we have uh, won by default. The Soviets disappeared, and somebody had to take the moral courage to be the policemen of the world, and they don't shy away from it. It is theirs and our responsibility to do this, and they think they're, they're providing a great benefit, but it's also the source of all our friction, and forced globalism is something that a libertarian uh, doesn't, uh, isn't attractive. To. Now, a lot of people, I well, I meet a lot of people who consider themselves on the right and they who voted for Trump and they told me they voted for him because they they were attracted to his non-intervention, his foreign policy. And he was uh, he made, you know, he made fun of Jeb Bush for his brother's war in Iraq right on stage at the debates. Uh -huh. And people thought that was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. People are sick and tired. Uh, people are sick and tired of these wars. Why would Trump then hire John Bolton, uh, at one of the biggest interventionists, one of the who is, you know, a lot of people call him a war criminal. Uh, why would he put the swamp in his cabinet if he came in with a mandate to clean out the drain the swamp and stop our wars? Well, I think when he was saying those things, he had his fingers crossed, you know, because it, it isn't it isn't consistent. If you go back and look at Bush, uh, George W. Bush in uh, 2000, I mean, if you look at his foreign policy, he was pretty good. You know, uh, non-intervention, don't believe be the policeman of the world, do not go into nation building. He answered this on the stage on one of his debates. And I said, boy. Maybe there's some hope, but he never believed that, and it never happened. Uh, Trump, I haven't analyzed him. He confuses me a, a bit, but that is the question a lot of people are asking. You know, way on the Liberty Report, when he does something that makes sense, we, we try to give him credit. We go out of our way. Like, if he says, well, let's bring the troops home from uh, Syria, and uh, let's bring the troops home uh, from Korea, you know, we say, good, good, good. But then after we defend him to a degree one day, then the next day— you know, it's been reversed again. So it's it's real hard uh, to figure that out. So I don't think I'm going to have the final answer. All I know is I look at the results and the results aren't exactly as uh, some expected. But he also understands politics. Uh, when you look at his crowds, those people uh, probably, uh, even though I could get some crowds out and they like non-intervention, uh, I, uh, I think the typical conservative really enjoys, you know, this nationalism and warmongering and fighting and all. And it's such a shame. But uh, Trump has skirted that. He uh, he still throws things out about bringing troops home and he's still not in nation building. So, so there's obviously a contradiction. It's not consistent. And when you look at it as Middle East policy and how what's going on in Iran, it's just is just outrageous. Well, so what's going on in Iran? Right. So that's why it's so you know, curious or maybe obvious to other people, he put John Bolton in his cabinet and John Bolton's been wanting to invade Iran since 1992. So um, that was a, so I, I try to tell people on this show that I voted for Barack Obama twice and I realized I was a chump twice because Barack Obama was a Nobel Peace Prize winner <laughs> who immediately ramped up the war in Afghanistan, st uh, started bombing Libya, turning into a failed state, dropped 26,000 bombs in the Middle East, ran out of bombs and then uh, killed Osama. I mean, he couldn't have been a bigger warmonger, you know, and uh, so he just took us from two wars to seven. He expanded the wars. I mean, there is it's like this uh, change, uh, 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 change on the outside, continuity on the inside. So there is no there is no break in our 
foreign policy. There seems to be a permanent state that's running our foreign policy. Is that crazy to think? No, no, that's exactly right. And I think what is interesting, it's um, it's not partisan. You know, you just mentioned, uh, you know, Obama, where he was said one thing and you, you believed he was going to be better. And then he turns out the same. And then you, he put him on the liberal side. Then you have George Bush saying the same thing. And uh, people... Uh, people like to hear that in, in spite of uh, in spite of the aggressiveness of conservatives. They still like to hear this. We're really for peace. But, uh, uh, Pompeo always says, I am for peace. But then you get a guy like Trump in. He's neither the conservative Republican nor uh, is he a liberal Democrat. He's sort of the independent that is going to clean out the mess. But guess what? Nothing changes. That shows you how powerful, you know, the military industrial complex is, how powerful the influence is on commercialism and and, uh, finances and and monetary policy because it is monolithic. And uh, all this stuff is just distraction. Uh, And and that that is why, you know, I have uh, I'm rather, rather cynical about most of of what's going on in politics, because there are some good people there. But uh, for the most part, uh, it's a distraction. If, if something is going on and they want you to to not pay attention to it, and something happens over there. So as we were improving our relationship with North Korea, we were making them a lot worse you know, when it came to Iran. But it seems like it's the same group of people. But I don't think you or I could come up and say, OK, we're going to name them because we're going to go get them. And there's 24 of them. And we're going to go out and round them up and everything is going to be okay. I don't think it's quite like that. uh, But there are some powerful forces. I see it in in finances, you know, and and the people who uh, donate the money, uh, you know, to uh, the corporate interests that donate the money, both for the campaigns as as well as the lobbying efforts. And that's why some people come to me, Ron, we really agree with you. That's why you need a lot more wars to tell people how they can spend their money. They shouldn't be allowed to spend their money. Of course, I believe that uh, petitioning the government is is important. The problem is there's too much stuff that the government has that auctions things off. They have too much too much expenditures, and therefore, you know, uh, a businessman almost out of self defense has to get involved because they're always regulating. And maybe I can save myself from some other regulation. In in one sense, we might even be able to give uh, Trump a little bit of credit there that some of the regulations were reduced, and I think that did help the economy. So, do you think I have a uh, a theory about? Uh, so, Trump came into office. He was a professed non interventionist, and you 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 say that you think he was crossing his fingers as he was saying that stuff. But I remember. Uh, when he came in, it really seemed to ruffle people's feathers that he wanted to pull out of Syria. Like people freaked out when he wanted to pull out of Syria. And so there's a theory that, well, I saw Chuck Schumer go on Rachel Maddow's show and say, well, yeah. if Donald Trump starts doing this stuff, what he's really doing is he's going against the CIA and he's going against the deep state or the permanent state, as people refer to them. Um, and that he better not do that. This is the This is the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. He's saying he better not do that because the CIA is going to screw him back. In fact, the words he used was they have six ways to Sunday to mess with you back. Now, is that what Russiagate was and the dossier? Was that there and the FISA investigation? Was that their way to mess with him back to say you better stop this pulling out of wars? Well, it, it's hard to tell. Sometimes, sometimes I think that big fight over the election was a distraction from the real investigation of when they got involved in the Democratic part of the organization, and they and they didn't want to get you know get that out in the open. But no, I I think it's hard to figure out exactly uh, who they are, but they're out there and they have a lot of power. And uh, I I don't think that. Uh, uh, Trump is a true non-interventionist, but I do think so. I listen to him, and I think he believes, uh, you know, that it would be bad to start a war. Matter of fact, I'm predicting that he's not going to roll a lot of tanks into Iran. But what I'm scared to death is why, and you asked the question earlier, why does he have guys like Bolton and Pompeo telling him what to do? Because it, they can get out of control, kind of control, and then the people uh, I mean, uh, Trump has a good ear for politics and uh, he's worked these coalitions. So in many ways, he does challenge the deep state uh, personality wise, who's who pulls the strings, who's in charge, who's powerful. But I don't think 
anywhere touching, you know, the philosophy, because the philosophy has to be challenged all the way back to our educational system. It has to be challenged all the way to our universities that teach all this stuff. And uh, nobody, nobody comes to Washington uh, having been exposed to Austrian free market economics. They've all been exposed to one form of it, and that is Keynesian economics that says you need a Federal Reserve so that people can run up a debt and you don't have to worry about the deficit and liberals can have their welfare and the conservatives can have their war. That, it's, that's in the past and that's, that's what they don't want to talk about, but that's where the action has to be eventually and it's going to come because this system is not viable. This, this system's coming apart. Not only do we see, and we've already talked about the fragility of our foreign policy and can't quite figure it out, I think basically the R argument is over personnel and the fact that this country is in much more serious strait than they'll met. We're a bankrupt and uh, they always have to fudge the figures and pretend there's no inflation and that uh, what, we, what, what we need to do is to spend more money and they get together and they always spend more money. There, there's no there's no backing off of anything. So they are locked in place. There's no backing off and that's why this is going to end badly and that is why uh, I'm glad to see, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, that uh, you're on the air and talking and try to get people to just look at truthful things because, uh, you know, like, let's take our non-interventions foreign policy. I think there's a lot more support out there than we hear, but not if you watch television. I mean, it, it means that if you and I talk about this, we might be accused of being un-American. They might not let me monetize my uh, Facebook pages and things like that. And that's already being attacked if you don't capitulate and go along with it. But the ideas have to change. If they don't change, it has to be tyranny. It, it, it'll drift into something like a Venezuela. I don't think we're that stupid, but then there are other days when I think we might be. So, But we have to have to uh, offer something different. And that's why you have to offer a different approach to economics without saying, when the Republicans finally get around, we need to cut some penny. They cut food stamps right. or something like that. And I thought, yeah, why don't you cut food stamps uh, for the military industrial complex? So my, my argument always when that question came up was, you know, I'm, I'm not going to attack, you know, some, some of the welfare system. Kids getting medical care, we've taught them to be dependent. But what I would do is I would cut billions and billions of dollars of running the world, put half of it toward the deficit, and put the other half to tie the people that are so dependent over until they can get in, dependent on themselves, independent. independent. That's the only way it could, but it's not, that's, they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to do that. We're going to keep marching on to this horrendous bankruptcy where uh, the people who have any money or sense and want to save themselves, they'll be out of here. And uh, there's already a lot of people who, the, the, a lot of money leaves this country. And uh, then, they'll, then they'll try to put prohibitions on taking your money out of the country. But that's what will happen. I mean, it happens in all the, all the countries. But we will have the opportunity, and that's where I'm optimistic. I, I think... I think meeting with so many young people, uh, uh, you know, if they hear the straight story, they say, you yeah, know, that does make sense. And uh, they will come around. I don't I don't believe that the image that uh, the millennials have been given, that all they do is waste money. They don't care. And they play video games. I guess they do a lot of that. But I also uh, look to it that you don't have to have, uh, you know, massive numbers. You just need a nucleus of people who uh, who come around to understanding this because it's it's not the masses that direct policy. It's it's the universities. It's the professors. It's the philosophy. It's the it's the propaganda about why if you're a good American, you have to be for all these wars and why they put the military people, the personnel on pedestals. You know, I, I was in the military for five years. And the, the most annoying thing is they come up to me and, uh, and they thank me for my service. I said, well, I do. They drafted me in, in, the, uh, in the 1960s during the Vietnam era. And I said, I, I, I didn't do anything. The only thing that I might have should have considered is why am I here? But, but you're put on pedestals and uh, because it's, it, that's what they want. They need the warmongering, they need the machine, they need to praise those individuals because then they don't have to face up to the fact when they look 
get on a bus or on a car or an airplane and see somebody that has neither arms or legs uh, realize, well, ah, that's because somebody sent them over to Iraq and, and Afghanistan and they had a little trouble. So that is that to me is just uh, uh, atrocious. And uh, so, the only thing I can solve this is to change it and go along with your suggestion about the non-interventions foreign policy. So that is such a great point you make about that we put our military on a pedestal. And it, to me, I, it smacks of propaganda every time. I've been to Afghanistan, and let me tell you, there's nothing more than a soldier likes is you to make fun of his off commanding officer or the president. Uh, they told me you can't make fun of the commanding officer, you can't make fun of the president when I went there. At the time the president was Bush, uh, first thing I did was made fun of President Bush and then their commanding officer, and they all stood up and cheered. And it turns <laughs> out that uh, everybody hates their boss. That's what it turns out. So, yeah. uh, so this idea that we get like... Uh, um, you know, like regular soldiers, once they come back from combat, they're almost universally against the war that they just came back from. Everybody I talked to who came back from Afghanistan and Iraq, they're they're against it. And I find some recruiters out in front of my house yesterday recruiting the kid across the street because he's washing his car and they stop their car to go recruit him into a war. And I asked the guy, and I said, hey, have you ever been in combat? He says, no. I go, well, then maybe you should get back in your car because this guy doesn't want to go to combat. And everybody I ever met who did go to combat tells people don't join. And I asked him, do you know what the suicide rate is for soldiers? He didn't know. That's what he told me. The guy who was recruiting kids off the street. So I got a predator in my neighborhood recruiting kids to go kill other people and get killed for the military industrial complex. And I'm sure he gets a check on, on his invoice, too, that he recruited another kid. So he gets another bonus star. So um, I don't know. So that's just a great point that you make that the military industrial complex and the media needs to put our military on a pedestal. And instead of what we should be doing is looking through reality, uh, instead of a rose colored lens at what's happening what we're really doing is terrorizing the world with our foreign intervention wars and right now the reason why we're getting away with it is because we figured out how to do it with our air power and to commit as few land uh, uh, soldiers as possible do you agree with that yeah, absolutely. And in, intertwined with that is the fact that uh, uh, we're the official counterfeiters of the world. We have a machine. Uh, if you had a gold standard, we literally could create gold and everybody would uh, recognize it. So the dollar is being held in much higher esteem, mainly because we are wealthy and we have the weapons and we throw our weight around and we can put on sanctions. So we intimidate people and they have to listen to them. But I think that just makes things worse. I think that just makes uh, a more resentment than ever, and that will be part of our problem. On this issue of, of going over there and fighting other kids, I always make the point that, you know, just think about it for a minute. Uh, if you're between 18 and 25, you're an American. Did, did we ever hear of a group of young men getting together uh, you know, and say, hey, you know what we ought to do? What we need is a good war, you know, and become he heroes. So we wouldn't need to do it. And then there's a group like this over in Iraq. You say, oh, yeah, we need a good war. I think we should uh, call the Americans names and maybe we can get war. And so these kids get together and kill each other. Obviously, that would be ridiculous. It's It's the People up there, it's the older people that aren't going to go marching. And it's also the money, that military industrial complex, a lot of pressure put on with that. And even our president said that, uh, you know, we can't cancel all those weapons to Saudi Arabia, no matter what kind of, uh, you, you know, morality they're falling in and what they're doing, uh, because uh, uh, we'd lose some contracts. If we don't sell them weapons, somebody, somebody else is good for jobs. And that. That's disgusting because uh, somebody's going to get killed with those weapons and somebody's going to have to pay for them. And uh, it'll suck us into the war as well. You know, when your son ran was on with Wolf Blitzer, I'm sure you saw this uh, a couple years ago, and he was questioning us selling arms to Saudi Arabia and he wanted to have a discussion about it. And Wolf Blitzer said back to him, well, you don't want to sell arms to Saudi Arabia. No, that's going to cost a lot of jobs back here. That was his. Was that's it? the newsman's position. It sounds like the newsman is sitting on the board of Raytheon. It doesn't sound like he's an actual newsman, and that's a big problem in our country too. Boy, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, right. I just want to real quick. People don't realize how Trump is going to get us into Iran, and Trump is going to get us into Iran uh, th 
through the AUMF, which is the authorization uh, for use of military force that we gave George Bush after 9-11. So he's going to and then he, of course, George Bush used that to go into Iraq. And now Trump, it looks like they're trying to find a way to use that to go into Iran. Is that what it looks like to you? Oh, yeah. And I think they're pretty much admitted admit that. And Pompeo was in a meeting just this couple of days ago, uh, you know, badgering the members uh, to prove to them that they do not have to come to Congress. And one of the examples given is that since 9-11, it's been used 44 times to, to go into battle. And of course, the wording of that, it's not complicated it, to, to the authority to go after those individuals who were responsible for 9-11. Well, the Iranians actually offered to help us after 9-11. Yep. And uh, this... And this this whole thing is is just based on a lot of lies. That's what's so disturbing, though. You think you're making progress. Most people in this country now know that Iraq uh, should have been fought because it was based on a lot of lies, uh, which is true. And now we're get finding uh, out about uh, you know Syria, all this stuff about uh, Assad gassed his own people. You know, we're finding out that they're they're based on lies. Oh yeah, let's go back a few years. How about the time I got drafted in 1962? You know, uh, it. It had to do with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, you know, and and uh, and that was all based on lies too. So governments lie; uh, the empire consider it treasonous uh, to tell the truth. So that that is why you will always hear the lies. But that should wake people up because right now, if you take polling, but it's always after the fact, and that's why the uh, the media gets ahead of us and gets us into trouble, then we have a long time just uh, trying to uh, prove, prove otherwise. So that's, uh, that's, that's really one of our biggest problems is uh, counteracting the propagandists. Hey, we just added St. Louis and Honolulu to our live tour schedule. Go to jimmydorecomedy.com for a link for all the tickets for all our live shows. We might be coming to your town. Go check right now at jimmydorecomedy.com. And if you like the show and want to support it, become a premium member. You can become a patron or through PayPal or go right to jimmydorecomedy.com and become a premium member. That's the best way. We'll see you at a live show.